In this Rogue Trader video, we're gonna be taking a look at character creation. We'll be looking through the archetypes as well as origins and home worlds, talking about characteristics and how to put that all together to make a character the way that you want. There is a lot to character creation in Rogue Trader and at first glance, it can be quite overwhelming, but it's not as complicated as you might think. And in this video, I kinda of wanna dive into that stuff to help you make a better character when starting out in Rogue Trader. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is the archetypes of the game or the classes. There are four base classes to choose from when making a character. And we sort of skipped ahead in character creation to get here first because I think it makes more sense to explain archetypes and then go through the home worlds and origins and characteristics as there are better ones to pick depending on the archetype that you want to play because your archetype is really going to dictate your playstyle. So the first archetype is Warrior. This is a melee focused combatant, meaning that they are going to engage in melee combat most of the time. They have a focus on movement, being able to move a lot, dodge uh, attacks, have high armor, and they can typically parry other melee attacks. And they can also taunt other enemies into attacking them. And they're just really kind of a tanky character that's going to charge in and melee enemies to death. So if you want to play a melee focused character, then Warrior is the way to go. And next up is the officer class. This base class essentially is a support type class that buffs your team. It allows your team to, you know, have more damage or have an extra turn or move more, or you can, you know, increase your momentum, allowing you to do some stronger uh, or use some stronger abilities in combat, like your heroic feats, etc. So if you want to play a character that's kind of supporting your team um, through these sort of things, then you would select the officer class. Next is the Operative class. They have a focus on intelligence perception. They like to exploit enemy weaknesses, and they typically have very high single target damage. If you want to be like a sniper, this is a great class for you. This is kind of what I'm playing in my playthrough. Um, they're also good at debuffing enemies and allowing you and your team to deal more damage to enemies and also making enemies just less effective in combat in general. So if you want to be a debuffer slash high single target damage character, Operative is not a bad choice. And then lastly, you have the soldier class, which has like a focus on agility and ranged weapons. And the core of this class is really moving and shooting and using cover and dodge to avoid take damage. They also use burst fire to like hit groups of enemies with bursts of bullets at a time or, you know, bursts of ammo, depending on what weapon they're using. So if you want to play more of like a close range uh, ranged attacker and not be like a melee character like the warrior, then soldier is a nice middle ground between operative and warrior. And then you also notice that there are advanced classes that you can choose from at level 16. Each base class can choose from one of three once they hit this level, and you'll be able to take levels in those or ranks in those uh, classes if you want. And there is some overlap, for instance, like soldier and operative can both become bounty hunters at level 16. But I would urge you not to worry so much about this when you're making your character because you should really focus your character on the playstyle that you want, right? So like if you want to be a melee character, you're going to go warrior. Like you're not going to, you know, wait to become a vanguard at level 16 to play as a melee character if you want a different class, etc. You're just going to take that at the beginning and then you can kind of tweak your melee character depending on what more you want to see from it at level 16. So I wouldn't worry too much about these advanced classes and just worry about the base class that fits your playstyle when making a character. So then we move back to the home world of the character and there are six home worlds you can choose from and these are going to give you a feature for each home world. They're going to give you some modifiers to your characteristics which are effectively your stats um, and how they affect your skill checks and combat etc. And some of these effects will be positive some will be negative for instance if you look at death world they gain strength agility and toughness and they lose intelligence and fellowship. So this is best suited for like a melee character since those three uh, characteristics modifiers are good for a melee based character like a warrior. And you don't really need intelligence or fellowship as much as you know, you need strength, agility and toughness for that sort of archetype. And you'll also notice that there are some features or talents that are available to you that that will become available to you depending on what home world you selected after you have an origin advancement and that is you know i don't want to get into spoilers or anything like that but that will happen at a point in the game and then you'll have access to these talents some of these talents you'll have access to anyway depending on you know what class you selected or what archetype you selected when you level up but some of them you know you might not so just i wouldn't worry too much about those for now focus more on the features that you will gain and also the characteristics that you'll gain and lose since that will impact your character at the very beginning of the game 
So Death World, as I mentioned, is very good for a warrior type class because of the characteristics you gain. They also have Survival Instinct, which makes it so that when they drop below 30% of their max health, that they will gain 20% of their max health temporarily. And they will also gain a 20% bonus to dodge and armor while they have at least one wound from any source. So, or temporary wound rather. So this is really good at keeping you alive. If you take a lot of damage in combat, frontline characters tend to take a lot of damage. So this again, behooves itself well to a warrior. Next, if you take a look at Voidborn, they gain willpower and intelligence, but lose a little bit of strength. They don't gain too many stats and lose too many here. So this is probably all around good, except for anything but a warrior because of the loss of strength. Any of the other three archetypes this would probably be great for. And Fortune is really, really strong. Being able to re-roll or make enemies re-roll constantly can really impact the effect of combat. So this is just a great all-around homeworld for basically any class but a warrior. You could still even run this on a warrior with minus five strength, and it wouldn't be the end of the world. So Hive World gives you Fellowship and Agility, which is good for basically any class. And you're going to lose a little bit of willpower. So you might not be a Psyker if you're going for this, but essentially what Strength in Numbers does for you is it makes it so that you gain more momentum when you're surrounded by enemy characters or when you have allied characters next to you. And momentum allows you to use like heroic feats more frequently in combat. So that could be really, really strong if you build for that. Um, but you basically need to create a character that's positioned next to other friendlies or next to a lot of enemies. So you're either going to be like a front lines like melee sort of character, or you're gonna maybe be like a backlines character that doesn't move hardly ever and just ranges. And if you take a look at Forge World, I really, really like this one. You have the option to pick from three different things here. You can gain armor, or you can gain more movement points and dodge chance, or you can gain increased critical chance. And these are based off different stats. You gain intelligence and toughness from picking this uh, home world and you lose a little bit of fellowship. So this is good for an operative. It's good for a warrior. It's good for you know, any sort of close range character or, you know, long range character like it's really, really good. Um, all you're really losing out on is fellowship, which means like officer might not be the best choice, but you can gain that extra armor if you need it. It'll like you're playing like a tanky character, like a warrior, or you can gain the agility bonus to movement points and dodge if you're playing like, you know, a light armor, like dodge type character, or that getting that extra critical hit chance if you're going intelligence, like maybe if you're playing like a sniper or something like that. All those are really, really good in my opinion. So this has a lot of application in terms of like, you know, pretty much any archetype you might choose. The Imperial World essentially gives you no negative effects and gives you plus 10 bonus to any of your characteristics except weapon skill, which is like melee attacks and ballistic skill, which is ranged attacks. So you can pick like strength or toughness or agility or perception. Any of those you can get a plus 10 bonus and you have no negative effects. So this is a really good choice. Like if you don't know what sort of character you want to play or like you know, you kind of want to have effectiveness in a lot of different areas and you haven't quite decided, like maybe you want to play melee and ranged and you're not sure exactly how you want to play. This is really good just to make sure you don't have any negative effects. And for Fortress World, you're going to gain perception and willpower and you're going to lose fellowship. So maybe not an officer if you're picking this one, but you will gain something called Never Stop Shooting when you take this home world. And what this does is it makes it so that if you kill an enemy on the next turn, you're going to have a chance to basically not consume an action point when you make an attack and maybe for it to not count as, you know, towards the attack limit per round, because normally you can only attack once per round unless, you know, an ability says otherwise. So you might actually get to attack for free and then get to attack again on that round. And that can be really strong. And there are other talents in the game that can increase the amount of stacks of never stop shooting that you gain to make this more likely to trigger, which you will probably take if you're taking this one. And it's just a really strong one overall. Um, if you're planning on playing like a Psyker or something like that, getting the extra willpower is also pretty good. So moving on to characteristics before we get into origins. And characteristics are kind of like the stats of a character for all intents and purposes. And these work somewhat similarly to Dungeons & Dragons. If you played Baldur's Gate 3 recently, you might remember that the you have an ability score. Like, you know, for strength it could be like 15 or 16 or 17. And then you have your ability modifier so if it was 15 strength, it would be plus two. If it was 16 strength, it'd be plus three. If it was 17 strength, it would still be plus three. Only going up at even levels, uh, the ability modifier. And it works somewhat similarly in this game. For instance, if you have 30 strength, your strength modifier or your characteristic bonus for strength is plus three. If you have 35, it's still plus three. If you have 40, it's plus four, et cetera. So those, you know, five numbers or whatever, like 35, 45, 55, don't actually add to your bonus. So you're trying to get, you know, to those zero numbers, 30, 40, 50, 60, etc. 
And if we take a look at what some of these things do, weapon skill is important for melee characters, increases their chance to parry and reduces enemies' chance to parry and dodge their melee attacks. Also increases their critical chance in melee combat, so if you're playing a melee-focused character, you will without a doubt want some weapon skill. And then, of course, ballistic skill affects your ranged attacks for your weapons. Makes it more likely that you will hit with ranged attacks in combat, so if you're playing like a sniper character, or if you're playing, you know, like an operative, or if you're playing a um, soldier, this would be a very good attribute for you or a stat for you. And strength impacts your melee damage as well as like how, how much, you know, heavy objects that you can pick up. So again, this is another good one for a melee character, like a warrior. Toughness increases the amount of max wounds a character has or, you know, essentially their max health. So the more toughness you have, the higher you're going to be able to damage you're going to be able to take. Um, it's going to make it harder for you to receive injuries, you're going to be able to resist poisons, etc. So if you're going to be a character that's getting hit often, then toughness is going to be important for you. Toughness is obviously one of those stats that's good for all characters, but it's even better predominantly on characters that are playing like tanks, like your warrior, or maybe your soldier that's going to be like moving in and out of combat that's going to be getting hit quite frequently that's not really going to be staying behind cover a lot. Agility increases a character's initiative, so it's going to help impact their turn order in combat. It's going to improve their dodge chance to avoid getting hit by attacks. It's also going to make it less likely for enemies to dodge their melee weapon attacks, so it's very important for a melee character. But it can also be very effective to soldiers and some of their abilities as well. So all in all, this is probably going to be something that's good on just about any character, but also good on characters that you, know, you want to go first in combat or that are going to be melee attacking. Intelligence is a stat that's very effective for operatives as it impacts a lot of their abilities that they use in combat. So you're definitely going to want some of that if you're playing an operative character. It also impacts some other abilities of other classes in the game. It also affects a lot of skill checks for like lore um, and tech use and things like that. So if you want a character that's going to be interact with the environment outside of combat and do so successfully very often, intelligence is good for that sort of character. And then we come to Perception. Perception is good for picking out details. Uh, it's, it's good for reducing enemies' dodge chance against your attacks. So, you know, if you're going to be playing like a sniper or something, Prime Perception is good for that so enemies can't dodge your attacks. It allows you to detect like hidden objects and things that you might not notice around the landscape, like traps and things like that. So if you have like a, uh, a front person or something like that, like a stealthy character also, this might be a good attribute for them. Willpower allows characters to resist warp effects throughout the game, and it allows them to, you know, pass some dialogue checks that might help uh, if they're interrogating characters or dealing with large groups of characters. And it's predominantly used for negating the mental effects of psychic power. So if you're playing like a psyker in this game and you want to be successful at it, you're going to have a decent amount of willpower because the more psyker abilities you use, you know, the, the higher chance of bad things happening to a psyker. So... This helps to counteract that. So then you have Fellowship, and this is kind of like Charisma or something like that. It allows the character to deceive other characters or charm them, friend them. Um, it's definitely beneficial for an officer. If you're playing the officer class, it can affect some of the abilities that officers use and the effectiveness of those. It's also good for like com commerce skills, for like selling and buying goods. It can affect prices and things like that. So this is just a generally all-around good skill that you will absolutely want on at least one character. And then inside those attributes or characteristics, you have skills that are you know, used inside and outside of combat, for instance, like coercion or logic or awareness, etc. And they all fall under one of these characteristics, so they gain benefits from those characteristics as well. And obviously they dictate a lot of like how successful you're going to be with certain actions in the game. And looking through those, you can kind of see, like for instance, as I mentioned earlier, lore falls under intelligence, a lot of the lore checks in the game. So if you want someone who's going to be able to like deduce like why something is there or what is going on in lore checks, then they would want to have high intelligence and you can kind of make your character around some of the skills that you might want. So then we'll move to origins and there are seven origins in the game. These typically give your characters characteristics and skill modifiers, uh, some sort of feature and eventually they'll give you even more modifiers after you've advanced your origin a bit. And I wouldn't, worry, again, worry too much about the origin advancement. I'd worry about what you're getting right now in terms of your play style, since that's going to impact you the most. Okay, so first up for origins is the Astra Militarum Commander. This gives you plus five to ballistic weapons and perception. So this is good for arranged. Anyone that's using ranged weapons will benefit from this. It also gives you plus five to athletics and Medicaid skills. So if you want those skills on your character, that you know this is a good choice. 
Additionally, it gives you regimental tactics, which you can use once per combat, that increases the damage of you and your allies to enemies that are around you or that are adjacent to their allies for until the end of your next turn. And this is quite a bit of damage. This is 20 plus 2 times your perception bonus. So if your perception is like 40 or something, your perception bonus would be 4. So you'd have 22 times 4. That'd be 88% extra damage for you know this turn for your allies and until the end of your commander's next turn so that's a lot of extra damage which is why you can only use it once per combat but again it's only to enemies that are adjacent to the commander or adjacent to their own allies but that's really really strong in my opinion and again you will probably pick this origin on a character that is a ranged damage dealer either close range damage dealer with ranged weapons or long range it doesn't really make too much of a difference up next, we have Commissar. Commissars are going to gain plus five to weapon skill and fellowship, meaning this is good for an officer class or for a melee class like warrior or, you know, for a melee officer. And they also gain plus five to coercion athletic skills, good for dialogue and good for, you know, traversing difficult terrain. Those are all really good. And they also have an ability that can be used once per combat called at all costs that applies to their next single shot or single target melee attack. So they could be ranged if you want, although because of their bonuses to melee weapon skill, makes more sense probably to use this with a melee attack it's not a must but you could um, but it basically makes it so that you can mark an enemy target and then whoever kills that target that's not you is going to gain an extra turn after their current one with more action points and more movement points so if you play divinity original sin it's kind of like challenge or something like that it gives you a, a bonus it's really nice or it's going to make it so that if you target an allied target that ally gains an additional action point and three movement points for their next turn so they're going to have a more effective turn so this is probably best on an officer because this is kind of what officers do anyway, particularly if you're making a melee one. Or maybe even on a warrior that you just want to be able to like buff something. So next is Crime Lord. They have plus five to weapon skill and perception. Weapon skill is good for melee combat. Perception benefits both ranged and melee combat, so it could be good for either. And they also gain a bonus to awareness and logic. So this would be good on like an operative type character or like a warrior type character generally. And because they have something called Surefire Plan, which gives them, like, basically a stack of a resource, the Surefire Plan resource, based on their intelligence bonus, which is typically, like, three or four if they have 30 or 40 intelligence. They can use this three or four times in a combat before it goes out. It allows them to buff their damage based on their perception. It allows them to increase their dodge and parry chance based on their perception. And it also allows them to penalize an enemy's damage based on their intelligence bonus. So... You know, you can use this in a variety of different ways, and you can use this multiple times in a turn. So you can deplete this resource, like, you know, in one or two turns, theoretically. And it's just really strong in general. And you'll probably take this on an operative-type character, because operatives typically have high intelligence and perception anyway. But you could also take it on, like, a melee-focused character because of the weapon skill. And you could give yourself more dodge and parry until the start of next turn, making you very hard to kill in combat. And keep in mind that there are talents that you can get that help you replenish these stacks so that you can keep this going during combat every turn. So it's very, very effective in my opinion. It's good on just about any character, but predominantly like maybe on operatives or melee-focused characters that want to gain some extra dodge and parry. Next is Ministor and Priest. They gain plus 5 toughness, plus 5 willpower. This is just good defensive stats for staying alive, but it's predominantly more useful on a you know frontline's character like a warrior or soldier. So if you're playing one of those, you might want to consider taking it. It also gives you Lore Imperium plus 5 and Medicae. So if you want those skills, you know, this might not be a bad origin. And the feature that they gain is War Hymn, which gives them momentum equal to two times their willpower bonus. So this is usually going to be like three or four at the beginning, depending on how much willpower they have, whether they have like 30 or 40. And it also gives additional momentum for each enemy that's either in a five cell radius around the priest or was hit by the priest this turn. And momentum, you know, makes it so that you can use your heroic feats more frequently in combat. And these can be game changers. They're very, very strong in a lot of cases. So if you're trying to make a character that's, you know, focusing around getting your momentum built up as quickly as possible to use those heroic feats, this might not be a bad origin to take. I don't think I would recommend it for a new player, but for someone who, like, has a really clear-cut idea of what build they want to make, this is a good choice. So next we come to Navy Officer. They gain plus five but agility, plus five fellowship. This is good for soldiers. It's good for officers. It's good for warriors. Agility is just good for frontlines characters in general. Fellowship is good for dialogue and, and for officer characters. So if you're playing, you know, any of those classes, this might be a good choice. You gain commerce and demolition. 
commerce obviously affecting prices of the game, so that's nice. Embrace for impact can be used once for combat. For one round, the Navy officer and, you know, allies that are in a three cell radius are going to reduce the damage they take by plus two from attacks for each archetype that the Navy officer has. So like, you know, this would be one at the beginning of the game. Once they hit 16 and select another one, this will go up to, you know, four deflection from two deflection. So, and you can only use this once per combat, but it's really great, like, if you move in with a melee character or a close range character, like a soldier, you don't have any cover, and you know you're going to be getting blown up the next turn, pop this, reduce the damage that you take, and you hang in there until your next turn. So next we come to Noble. This gains plus five intelligence, plus five fellowship, plus five coercion, plus five persuasion. This is really good on an officer, in my opinion. Fellowship behooves them. Um, this character is typically good at dialogue because they have high fellowship anyway, so persuasion and coercion really help them. And they have like a really interesting, unique feature in my opinion. Their feature, You Serve Me, allows them each combat to dictate a character that's the servant for them for that combat. And every time they use an ability that affects the servant, the servant gains plus five to all characteristics until the start of the noble's next turn. And then any time the servant attacks a target, that the Noble dealt damage to last turn, the Servant gains extra critical hit chance against the target. Again, this can only be used once per combat, so you're going to use this at the beginning of the combat, and then these effects will, you know, continue throughout that combat. But it allows you to have a synergy with basically one other character that can really buff the Servant's effectiveness in combat the more that you guys, you know, focus on the same enemy and you use abilities that buff that character. And again, because you're playing an Officer, probably if you're playing this background or this Origin, rather, um, you're going to be able to buff them very easily, and if you make sure that they attack the same target as the character that's noble, then they're going to get even more critical chance, which is great. And lastly, we come to Sanctioned Psyker, which gains toughness, willpower, gains some lore warp, and carouse. And this is good for, you know, anyone who wants to be a Psyker in this game. You can play a Psyker um, as any of the classes in the game and still use Psyker abilities. But if you want to play as a Psyker from the beginning of the game with your character, then you're going to want to go with Sanctioned Psyker. There are some characters in the game like Companions that don't have this origin that are still Psykers. But if you're playing like a custom character and you want to be a Psyker, you're going to want to choose Sanctioned Psyker. It also makes it so that you're less likely to have negative effects from using Psyker abilities. So this is really good for you. So that kind of wraps up our video on character creation and Rogue Trader, and I hope you guys kind of see why I reorganized it, because if you're not familiar with the archetypes and characteristics and what these stats and archetypes do, when you pick a homeworld or origin, it might not match up real well. I mean, you can play any and, you know, get along just fine, but if you're talking about min-maxing and synergies, obviously, you're going to want to try and pick a homeworld and origin that match the playstyle. You know as best as possible so going to archetype and characteristics first i think makes more sense than going through homeworld and origin so i hope you can see why i reorganized a little bit as always if you have comments or questions about some of the things during character creation let me know and i will get back to them as soon as i can